Hello, everyone. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Pablo Langa. I'm the founder and managing partner at TDDM Partners. And it's a pleasure for me to host the webinar today around generative AI in, uh, in education. Uh, I'm very excited to be the host today and to be joined by uh, three different initiatives and phenomenal individuals that started with uh, generative AI and chat GPT before it was, uh, it was a big trend. Uh, so very excited about that. Um, before we move on, actually, I also wanted to make sure I uh, congratulate uh, everyone on International Women's Day. Um, a little bit of, uh, of logistics as well. Uh, the session will be recorded and we will be sharing all the materials with you all. Uh, and hoping that you will get to join the, the conversation through the different, uh, the different streams that, that we have available. Uh, so far, more than almost like a thousand people uh, registered for the webinar. So thanks so much for the, uh, for the interest. In terms of agenda for, for today, uh, we'll start with uh, a very brief introductions and housekeeping. Uh, and then we'll give the opportunity for uh, these three different individuals and initiatives to, uh, to share a little bit about their journey uh, with uh, AI and generative AI and also a little bit about themselves. Then we'll open up for a, for a panel and uh, we'll wrap up with, uh, with some hopefully Q&A uh, coming from, uh, from, from all of you. So uh, uh, excited to, uh, to start the conversation. In case you didn't know about EDT and Partners, um, we are a, a global uh, consulting uh, firm dedicated to the business of education. Uh, we work in three major verticals. Uh, strategy and growth, uh, helping at techs, universities and schools uh, grow into other markets, product and technology, and that's the main part of the conversation today, and, and also M&A. Um, we wanted to address, before I open up to the other participants, uh, the elephant in the room. We were asked by a few people, like, hey, why we only have product people uh, and companies in the conversation today? Where are the educators? Where are the faculty? Uh, we acknowledge this, and uh, it's impossible to have everyone in the same room, especially in, in a one hour of time. So we'll make sure the next webinar in the next five to six weeks uh, will bring uh, policymakers and practitioners, faculty and teachers from different parts of the world to discuss around uh, ChatGPT and AI uh, from their perspective. Uh, without further ado, I'm, I'm excited to introduce the, uh, the three speakers, starting with, uh, with Ben Whiteley. Uh, co-founder and CSO at, at Memrise. Um, ben is, a, is an entrepreneur, studied neuroscience uh, at Oxford, and has a, a deep passion for learning languages by doing. Uh, so, Ben, I think you're, you're muted, but great to, great to have you here. Great to be here. Excellent. Uh, also, we have uh, Carla Susana uh, uh, with an educational psychology background, uh, joining from my uh, beloved Spain. Uh, as the head of sales at Conley. So, Carla, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Excellent. And uh, last but not least, um, Basil, uh, founder at eFlow, uh, uh, initiative based at UAE. So, I, I didn't mention we wanted to have a little bit of diversity from location. So, uh, uh, Memrise uh, represented by Ben coming from the UK, Carla from, from Spain, and, and Basil representing the UAE and the Middle East. Uh, I think joining from Lebanon today, and uh, Basel, uh, you know, a computer scientist with a true passion for education. This is his second startup in the space. Um, you know, phenomenal uh, vision and, and passion for technology and AI from early ages. So I'm really excited to hear what uh, what he has to say and then demonstrate with his solution uh, deploying AI. So without any further ado, I promise I do the intro in two minutes. I took before. Uh, so I'll hand it over to I'll hand it over to Ben, so he can explain a little bit more about himself and, and about Memrise. Thanks, Ben. Amazing, thanks, Pablo. So yeah, I mean it's it's true what Pablo says. I, I have a passion for learning through doing, and that, I think that gets to the heart of a lot of how I think about learning. And a lot of that is rooted in that early experience I had studying neural networks 20 years ago at Oxford. And one just little anecdote before I get into the um, style of, of Memrise here is that which I think is kind of relevant to how I think about large language models as well. So, and, and their role in education. So my, my tutor was a, was a neuroscience professor and I was working together with him on my sort of final piece looking um, for final exams, looking at evolving neural networks and how we're going to manage that. And yeah, he was a professor, he'd written dozens of papers and many books on neuroscience. But as we were talking about this, how to, how to structure this particular problem, I just, 
what he was telling me didn't make sense. And, and I just, it just didn't check out with how I understood it. And so I went away, did more research, thought about it some more, came back with different ideas. Now, I never persuaded him of my point of view, but I questioned it. And out of that questioning came a lot of new ideas about how humans learn and how we should be training language models to learn, which is a lot based on learning through doing. And I took that idea, and that is actually what led me then directly a few years later to founding Memrise, these ideas of how, how human brains learn through doing stuff. And what I think is interesting, you know, we, we, and we've grown Memrise, well, I can talk more about Memrise later, but the whether the professor was actually right or whether he was teaching me the truth didn't actually turn out to be the important point in that educational experience for me. What turned out to be important was the human discourse between us where I could have a discussion about it, find where things didn't work, and, and then go and research some more. And that's core to how I think about LLMs in education. So I want you to hold that in mind as, as, you're think, as, as we're talking about this, that it is like, where does education change as access to human-like conversation becomes ubiquitous, rather than just looking at whether LLMs are always talking the truth, whatever that elusive concept may mean. So here we've got a little bit of background on Memrise. I'll pause for a moment there, but switching to this slide, we've got a bit of background on Memrise, which is crucial to understanding how we're using LLMs at the moment and what we built with them. So language learning essentially is a very simple process. There are two things that you absolutely need to do. And one thing that can be really helpful to reduce stress and, and boost confidence. So the two things you absolutely have to do are number two and number three on this list. You absolutely have to try to understand language that's just above your current level. That process of your mind making sense of target language is you learning the language. You also have to overcome your fear of speaking and try and express yourself in the language. It can then be helpful to explicitly learn words and phrases and have grammar explained, that can make you go faster. But points two and three are the, are the sufficient. Point one tends to be what we think of as language lessons, but it's not actually necessary and it's not actually sufficient. The biggest barriers to language acquisition are those second two. Access to enough content that's just above your current level and enough opportunities to practice talking in situations that don't make you feel stupid. The second, uh, the third on this list, so communicate, is especially difficult. So human children get this from their parents. Parents can't help talking in kind of simplified language to small kids. Um, and that's hugely important. It helps hum humans a lot to make progress. But if you want a kid, how do you do it? And kind of the classic way is to get a love interest who speaks the language. It's a kind of cliche for a reason. You need a big incentive to be very patient um, um, with the tedious, simple level of chat of a language learner or you can pay and go and get a tutor. But for most people in the world, those aren't viable options. People wanting to learn English, most of the people across the world wanting to learn English can't afford to pay English teachers um, the prices that the uh, English teachers command, and they don't have access to people who may become their potential love interests. Large language models and their ability to have hu human-like language represent a complete step change in what is possible, because now you can practice language for real. So, Next slide, if we just look at how we've done that. And in fact, if we can play the video on the next slide. Let's then watch this for a moment. You're choosing a conversation here. Yeah. Huge range of things that you can choose from. Each mission has a kind of description of what you have to try and achieve. The bot then sends you messages. It can speak them out loud and you can then talk back. If you don't understand it, you can translate it. And then you, in this case in Spanish, so you can speak into it in Spanish. It understands what you're saying. So if you're talking about irrelevant things, it can re still reply to you. It corrects you when you make a mistake. <clears throat> um, and you can also, if you don't know how to talk, you can reply in English and translate it. So what this is doing is giving not only the opportunity to have a fluent and normal conversation um, in spoken language, where you can say anything you like, but it's also giving you suggested responses, it's correcting your grammar, 
It's allowing you to translate when you don't understand things that actually aren't present in the overwhelming majority of real human to human interactions when you're learning a language. So not only does this actually replicate the positive parts of having a conversation with a human, it actually gives you more than you get from a human because it gives you all of this framework around the side, which so, would be great if you could get from a human, but isn't generally available. So the key takeaway here is that I think back to the point I made at the beginning that language learning is this example of where the human-like discourse is the really, really important thing in the educational experience. Being able to practice having a conversation, whether or not the conversation is true, and in these situations that we set up, there's, it, it doesn't really matter if it's te if the LLM is coming up with something that is objectively true, you're going through the process of a, of a conversation. That's the important part. And I think there are actually a huge number of moments in education where the discourse, the fact of discourse with a seemingly intelligent being is actually more important than just the mere impart, imparting of information. And actually, I'll just finish with a final piece of data, which is kind of interesting for us to see. So there are a whole load of different conversation types that you can have or situations you can have a conversation in there. The most popular ones are telling someone you, you love them without saying I love you and breaking the ice with a stranger. So people are doing this in order to have human conversations, not just to sit in that artificial intelligence world. So I've gone way over time, but I'll stop there. Apologies for that. No, no worries, Ben, it was worthwhile. Uh, thanks, thanks for that. And indeed, I think, uh, you know, the the ceiling that you're breaking uh, with, I mean, you didn't mention, but you've been flirting with AI for, for, for many years, uh, up until kind of last year with, uh, with recent development that, Kind of getting into large uh, language models uh, kind of makes this breakthrough an opportunity. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more later about kind of the opportunities right, for We built multiple language bots before LLMs, but this is just a, such a step change uh, difference. Yeah, I, I, I bet, I bet. So, looking forward to hearing more about that. Now, uh, over to uh, to Carla with another use case. In this case, more around content creation and and potential self service experiences. And again. These are initiatives that have been uh, working with AI, generative AI, and, and, and large models for, uh, for for many months, uh, way before it was uh, you know popular for everyone. So lots to learn from from them. Carla, uh, over to you. Thank you, Pablo. I will try to do it short and sweet. Conley has created a unique solution for the global ethic challenges, in order to help teachers and students. Using your own content, Koali generates learning activities and resources, and it does it automatically through the AI, and it does it in multilingual form. In addition, Koali can be used as a private teacher, so it can support the students by asking them questions or explaining them the different topics in an easier way, so the students with different learning skills can understand them. Now, as you will see, in the video, you will you will see how how Koali works and how it does it. As you can see, before it took us about three months to do the whole questions. Now, in in less than three months, we can do more than ten times what we used to do. It can be used for everybody. And of course, it, it cuts down all the repetitive tasks that we don't really like. So it, it gives you more space to do other things that, that we consider more important as being closer to the students, for example. And as you could see, Koali helps you to increase your content creation and through the webinar, all of you will be able to know more about Quanli and how this tool can impact the education system. Thanks so much, Carla. Uh, that was uh, short and sweet. Appreciate it and uh, <laughs> super impressive. Uh, I think a, a couple of questions are coming up around, uh, you know, what does this mean for the traditional content creator and those, uh, you know, uh, individuals that were working in that specific field, but we'll, we'll kind of pose those questions yes. in, in, in just a second yeah. after, after Basil does his introduction. Yeah. 
Thanks for that. And, and I think uh, now over to Basel, uh, talking about in this case, uh, how with eFlow they've built uh, the ability to create micro learning experiences uh, through kind of uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, the, the typical social media that we'll be using in everyday uh, matter. Uh, so I think excited for, for Basel to show us what they can do. I think some of you that actually registered to, to this webinar using uh, cell phone numbers already got a snippet of uh, what Diflo does. Uh, but Basel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo, for having me. Uh, just a quick intro about uh, myself. So uh, I'm a computer engineer. I've been in the ed tech industry for the last six years. And I consider myself uh, passionate for, uh, like, um, curious about solving the problems when it comes to online learning. Um, I tried a lot of technologies, uh, different uh, approaches of learning to solve the problem that we have with education, as I used to have some problems when it comes to uh, education. So this is why like, I'm here, and this is why uh, we created uh, IFLO. So now we're talking about ChatGPT, generative AI. Uh, before, before, we had a lot of technological advancements out there. But the online learning approaches and plat we have a lot of online learning approaches and platforms. But recent statistics show that online learning is still broken. And this is based on the recent statistics that we have. So it's failing to adapt to our busy schedule and lifestyle. Uh, so this is the reason why we created eFlow. So what it does is it enables learners to learn through AI powered conversations from where they already are on instant messaging and communication apps. So these conversations are personalized and adapt to the learners' targets, goals, and even to their busy schedule. So to learn, to learn, learners don't have to download any app. So all they have to do is chat with our AI-powered tutor on their preferred platform. If it's WhatsApp, if it's Instagram, if it's MS Teams, or if it's uh, even Slack. Uh, they can learn about different topics from leadership skills to financial literacy to even generative uh, AI. Next slide, please. So actually here we have a QR code that you can scan and you can directly talk with the bot on WhatsApp and get a demo course on generative AI. So you have one, two, three. Next slide. I hope you scanned it. So when it comes to generative AI, it's the core of our platform and we, we've been using it for the past two years before ChatGPT was cool. Uh, and it is the core of our learning approach. So if generative AI is not there, we won't be able to generate, uh, to create this platform. Uh, so when it comes to generative AI, it helps us with three different aspects. So one, it helps us with content flow creation. Uh, two, it enables us for a more personalized experience and even personalized assessments for learners as they're going through the conversation. And it helps us to provide personalized feedback for learners as they are chatting with the AI tutor. So now I'm gonna play a short video. Uh, I was gonna show the core features of eFlow's platform from the authoring tools to content delivery and even analytics. So here you can see the main three um, steps that we have. So one, you can create guided conversations. So it's kind of powered by AI, and then you have to put a guide. Uh, second, you can see here, there's an example of how it's running on WhatsApp. So this is an actual uh, conversation. And in this conversation, you can see the different responses for the learner. Uh, so here, it's asking a question about if they know what generative AI is. It provides a personalized feedback based on that. The conversation is not only text, it can include also different media and even assessments, as you can see uh, in the screen now. So this is an example on WhatsApp, but this also works on MS Teams, for example, on Slack, on different platforms. So this is an example on uh, MS Teams. So, and lastly, as educators, we understand that we need to uh, know the, uh, like the performance of the learners, analyze how learning is. So we have uh, fully fledged analytics and uh, 
performance measuring on the platform. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, I'm I'm proud of the four of us. Uh, we're we're managing to be on track after the introductions and, and the first overview. So thanks thanks the three of you. Um, thanks for making up. Uh, <laughs> no, come on, that's that's fine, Ben. Um, and I'm I'm excited about this uh, second part of the conversation, a little bit more open, uh, you know. But of course, we couldn't get into a panel discussion about ChatGPT and not ask ChatGPT about its opinion. So, uh, for those intrigued, uh, we did ask. You can see the prompt uh, for ChatGPT helps in terms of framing some of the questions. Uh, I guarantee that what you're about to hear is genuine. We didn't uh, copy any of these questions, but uh, I can also tell you that they were pretty, uh, pretty spot on, uh, at least for half a general guidance on, on what to ask for this type of audience and considering the type of speakers. But now kind of moving into, into uh, an open conversation and, and please, the, the three of you, feel free to, uh, to answer in whatever order uh, uh, you, you like. Um, you know, very uh, different kind of solutions leveraging AI, uh, and obviously, uh, you know, there is a need to uh, there is a need for speed in terms of the bringing innovation to, to this space. Can I ask you what's in the what's next? Right? What's what's your most immediate uh, next step with uh, with AI? Considering, you know, uh, a new API was just announced by OpenAI very recently. Uh, what, what do you have uh, ready to be released that you can share with, with the audience and with us uh, you know, in the next couple of months? Anyone? Yeah, I'm going. Actually, our next milestone is the in exactly the integration of Koanli in the main open LMS. So our students and the educational institutions use just one login for all their products so they don't have to, to go to each platform to to study or whatever, so they can have it all in one. Uh, for us, Pab yeah. So for Please. us, Pablo, when it comes to uh, when it comes to the milestones that we have, so first of all, we're collecting uh, data from different learners and responses. This is where we fine tune the model and optimize the model. Uh, but specifically, uh, we're also working on our intermediate model that is uh, factually checking the information that is being sent to the learners. So we do have a model right now, but we're enhancing it to do that. Because when it comes to education, you can't just uh, throw out any answer. You have to make sure that this is factually correct. Uh, so this is currently our main focus uh, right now. Yeah, so for us, well, we, we started building this, as Pablo said, long before ChatGPT came out. So we were building on GPT-3. <clears throat> and and did, did a bunch of um, very specific programming we needed to do in order to make it work with, with GPT-3. Now that the chat GPT API has come out, we're switching straight over to that. It's already getting us better um, results, just more creative responses. But I guess the other thing is when, when you go sort of below the hood, so when you come to the Memrise, we call it the Membot, when you're talking to the Membot, and I noticed Sarah B asked, is it voice input? Yes, it's it's voice input as well. So voice input, output, as well as text, you can choose. There is the user experience where you're talking to this bot, but that's not actually the only place where we're using ChatGPT and GPT-3 within this. So there are other things we need to set up. When you're having a conversation in the Membot, there are completion targets. So we want to say, you've got to persuade this waiter to give you a 20% discount on the food. And it won't just give it to you because you ask. You've got to persuade it. So we first of all need to get the bot to behave in a way where it won't just give in straight away. But also we need to recognize when you have achieved that result. In the olden days, we'd have done that with a string match where it's like, have you said, has the bot yes. said this? But of course now we're looking to do this through um, trying to read the sense in what the bot is um, e expressing and where the conversation has got to. And so you can do that just by feeding the conversation into GPT-3, into chat GPT, and asking it to make a judgment. But actually, you can make it a lot better by giving it specific examples, fine-tuning it, asking it to check its own judgments, and also to break it down. So rather than just saying, has this been reached, you can ask it to say, make the case that this has been reached. Make the case that this goal hasn't been reached. Now make a judgment on which of those is true. And then it does very much better. So if you break it down into steps, 
So we've also got a bunch of improvements that are kind of under the hood there around the way that we judge completion of a particular mission, we call them. And then finally, we also get G chat GPT to generate new missions. And so we need to, the, the, what the situation you're in, what the character of the bot is, what you're trying to achieve and trying to get it to generate really good missions that have a good tension. They're kind of fun to play. That is such a big part of making this an enjoyable user interface, user experience, mm -hmm. which is kind of crucial to people doing it. So we've got a whole load of improvements on that rolling out, all empowered by this move to chat GPT API and the reduction in cost that comes with that. Fantastic. Thank, thanks to the three of you. And uh, there is an immediate, probably short question to all of you, and especially those that are either, you know, connecting to us today or seeing this recording later on. You know, how long did it take you from, hey, uh, let's implement ChatGPT for this very specific use case to actually have it in production? Because I think this could be a good reference for a lot of uh, organizations to realize the amount or you know complexity to to get this uh you know in a tested manner in front of customers and maybe ben we'll start with you with a short answer there so where we were starting building with gpt3 not chat gpt it getting getting a really simple version of it up didn't take us very long it took us took us a couple of weeks to have something kind of working getting it working well was a lot of content job uh, and how you make the how you create tension in the conversation and then how you get that um, success, the goal complete criteria judgment really good. That took a, a, a couple of months. Um, though, honestly, if, GP, if chat GPT had been out when we started doing this, it would have been very yeah. much shorter. So I think the cycle times come down dramatically. And I think what you can achieve with these has gone so, so far, so fast. Um, yeah, the, the time has come right down. Yeah, Carla, uh, similar experience, experience for you. Oh, sorry, uh, Basel, if you want to jump in. Go, go. Uh, sorry, ladies, ladies first, uh, go on. <laughs> Actually, Carla, we, we <laughs> before the launching of OpenAI, we did train our existing model and it took us a long time. <laughs> and then having tri tried both systems, OpenAI allows us to cut down our tests from weeks to hours and then in addition, in March, OpenAI announced the release of the API, so that will make it quicker. So it was a tough time, but now it looks like it's pretty much easier if you have an agile product that, that can help. Uh, Pablo, for, for us, for when it comes, yeah, so when it comes to the platform, so we created the platform knowing that GPT-3 was out there two years ago, and we built it in a way that we want to interact with this AI model to have this conversation. So the structure that was put was easy to, to add uh, like GPT-3 or this, uh, this model. Uh, so when it comes to integrating the model, it's something simple if you have the structure for that. But as Ben mentioned, uh, you have to do a lot of uh, fine tuning, prompt engineering, like you have to do a lot of stuff to optimize it for your use case. And this is the most time consuming thing. It's not just integrating the, the API. Integrating the API can be done by any developer. It's making it work for your use case in the approach that you I, that you need. I, I think just to add on that, Basil, the, the, the actually the, the longest delay when I think about it, once we really got going, it, it just took a couple of weeks to get it out there. The big delay was actually nine, 10 months, maybe even a year between when we said, this is a tool that we've got to use. It can do something incredible to actually getting it, getting the project moving. And the problem with it was that it requires such an oversight of an understanding of how AI models work and an understanding of how product works, an ability to write a back end that can speak between the two and an understanding of how to turn that into a front end um, experience yeah. application. Yeah. But doing that in a way where none of the bits are set. So, so normally you've got your front end developer who knows how to do his bit or her bit. You've got your back end developer who knows how to do her bit, but it needed someone who had that oversight. So we have my co-founder, Greg, came in who has exactly that experience and Greg and I worked on it together. We've then got a product manager, Luis, who's got a 
PhD in machine learning. He's absolutely spans that understanding of the product side and really understands that. And I think that it really plays into finding these people who've who straddle those skill sets of understanding the development, but at the same time, understanding the user experience and really finding that. Also, now our tech lead on it, Francis, as well has got that kind of full stack understanding. And I think you do at this point need that kind of a person to, to really get purchase on what's possible. In, in interesting, Ben, uh, you touched on profiles, and this was one of the questions I wanted to touch on. Uh, I thought the edtech or education sentence of the last three decades was uh, lifelong learning. I think, uh, you know, one of my hairs was falling every time I will hear the, the, the sentence. Uh, but I think now, and, and that's why I'm almost bold, uh, now, now uh, I think ChatGPT is, is coming to replace. But another, uh, and I think uh, it was Basel that mentioned this, prompt engineering and prompt engineers uh, is, is, is coming up quite rapidly as uh, one of those kind of new jobs that didn't exist or new skills that people didn't know about. So tell me, uh, uh, and then we can start with maybe with Carla this time. Uh, Carla, if you can tell us a, a little bit about the profiles that you needed uh, or that you need actually to, to continue growing uh, uh, the organization. Uh, you have an education psychology background and uh, um, you know, how, how are you equipping yourselves to be able to be ahead of the pack, especially with shortening times for innovation, right? As, as we just described. We are actually really lucky because before this crazy FIBA, we already had a team that covered the three main or core specificities of the business. We had the depths, we had the product, and we had a bunch of pedagogy psychologists, social content. So we all work together. Of course, we had to specialize and prompt engineering. It's been <clears throat> the main, but we already had an expert in that and we didn't even know. So, so that helps a lot. So, so we, we didn't have to look for it because actually it's not that, that known. So yeah, we, we have been lucky, but our team will have to grow and we'll have to find new roles and new models so we can cover more about that. I don't know if I answered your so, question. Basil, yeah, yeah, you did, you did. Uh, Basil, maybe uh, if you can maybe uh, follow on on the, on the question by, I don't think everyone might know about prompt engineering. I think a good group of people in, in the call today might, but uh, if you can describe in your own words what you are doing with prompt engineering the skills that that required. Uh, yeah, so just to touch up on like uh, some hires or some people that we have to also work with. So as Ben mentioned, you have to have an understanding of how the models work, how are they trained, how do they understand the information, and based on that, you can do like optimize it for your use case. So it's very crucial to understand the underlying technology, not just see what's out there. You have to understand how it understands the context. What are transformers? Uh, how does it know uh, what to say based on what? So by knowing this, you would be able to uh, have like a prompt. So um, you can have a specific text that you write to this model to get it to get to give you the response that you need. Uh, so some of the prompts out there, for example, act as uh, an AI tutor or as an interviewer you know this knowledge, you can answer this, so you can put some constraints, you can put some things that they can focus on, you can give them some sort of uh, rules that they have to follow. So this is when it comes to prompt engineering, controlling this model to work for your use case in the way that you need it uh, to do. Perfect. I, I, don't know, ben. I don't know if you guys agree with this, but what, what I found was in the early days, the early days back in the dawn of this technology like last year, <laughs> the prompt engineering was was a lot of what we were doing and it was trying to work out how do you get this it, this model can produce human-like language but how do we get it to constrain it and we spent a lot of time saying writing prompts saying the member is a waiter in a restaurant it's friendly it uses simple language that a five-year-old could understand trying to do things like this to try and constrain it and, and, and nurture it in the right direction but uh, and, and 
then once we got quite good at that, we got good at asking GPT-3 to generate the prompts itself. And once we set, so we, we, we sort of set up the architecture so that we were putting an input and then asking it to, asking GPT-3 to generate something, then GPT-3 to check what it was doing in this kind of circular um, checking process. And then we found more different people could be good at writing uh, the prompts when those constraints were on the system. Then ChatGPT came out and ChatGPT was just better at writing the prompts than our system. So then we took ChatGPT and put the, and, and structured that in an architecture like our system and find that we can get even better results. So, so it's like, I think that part of me thinks that this problem of prompt engineering was a really big deal a year ago. And the better and better the models get and the more trained they get and the more time you spend fine tuning the model, the kind of less important prompt engineering becomes and the more important architecture and fine tuning becomes. That, that's that been our, our experience so far, but I'd be really interested to hear from either, either of you. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Yeah. Brilliant. So I, I need to ask uh, this Two next questions. I think in, it, it's a recurring topic in all the different forums and, and kind of projects that we are involved. Uh, one is connected, and, and you've touched on it already, which is around correctness, uh, right? Uh, making sure that uh, the data that gets produced is, uh, you know, it's 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 correct and it's it's not hurting anyone's feelings. Uh, put it that way. Uh, that's, that's number one. The second one is about ethical considerations, how the models are being trained, how, you know, this uh, new uh, content generated by generative AI needs to be labeled or disclaimed uh, as, it's, as it's being used. Uh, and probably there is, a, there is a set of additional questions on the ethical front and the correctness uh, that we could be asking. But start with uh, correctness and and ben i can i can pick on, on on you you mentioned that for language learning obviously uh you know if you are just mocking a conversation the fact that you know the 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 ai uh, bot doesn't know that the, the car cannot be 500 euros uh, it's not relevant right uh, what's important it, it is the interaction it, exactly because you're kind of going through a process and in fact it can it, it can lead to humor as well i guess the other angle the, the, a place where I, I mentioned that the bot can correct your grammar at this point so at the moment it corrects your grammar something that we're testing which we will put in because it, it definitely works very well but is something where we need to be conscious of this accuracy is in grammar explanations so at the moment it corrects it but if we can say like, why was that wrong what was the mistake there it's pretty good at telling you that but we do need to work a little bit harder because at the point at which memory starts saying just fictitious grammar explanations well that that yeah. kind of is a problem if we if we just tell an early learner something that just patently isn't true that's a problem it, it's something that um isn't actually i think we can get around relatively easy but relatively easily but i think it's at those points where you've crossed the line from the educational experience coming from discourse and discuss and, and the process of trying out ideas discussing ideas moving them around between people and goes to i am asking it to impart correct information well now it needs to be correct but i think my argument is that that's actually a relatively small portion of really effective educational experiences. The amount of time, if you can just look it up on Google, that's not really the heart of what the educational experience is. And I think what's really exciting about LLMs is the, the that this huge new dimension they open up that we haven't even considered before because it's been so obviously impossible. You've needed a teacher, you need a human to discuss it with you but you don't need a human to discuss it with you anymore. You can have that discussion and try and work out, is, is that true or is that not? I don't know, I can, I can try and argue it around, see if I can persuade it. Um, we can create those experiences yeah. without the need for an actual human there. Brilliant, I think I'm gonna move on to the next question and, and pop it for, for Basil or, or, or Carla. Uh, you know, there was a, there is different trains of thought here, uh, some, uh, you know, big uh, education districts in the U.S. are are kind of forbidding the usage of uh, ChatGPT, and they, they've made headlines. 
Also, IB International Baccalaureate uh, has come out and actually very uh, proactively suggested that, uh, you know, ChatGPT should be allowed, uh, you know, for, for kind of the assessment and, and the learning progress for, for IB. Uh, so here is this two confronting kind of uh, trains of thought. Also, I think there is one of the very first research uh, activities that have come out of the U.S. where they actually surveyed 2,000 teachers. Uh, 40% of them claim to use ChatGPT at least once a week. Uh, 40%, which in my opinion, it's a pre once a week. It's a pretty high number. So uh, a lot of the attention is going on how you know, learners and uh, people that need to get certified are, are using ChatGPT, but we're already using uh, educators and, and faculty and teachers you know, using this technology on uh, on their favor. And no surprise here. For me, the question is, um, and, and maybe Carla, you are, you are best suited to, to address this one. Uh, if already teachers are using the help of, of ChatGPT to create lesson plans, I'm assuming, and, and to create kind of uh, probably interventions and, and additional content, are we entering a new world where... Uh, you know, genuine content creation uh, value uh, starts to go to zero uh, since everyone can, you know, have a healthy interaction with the bot and create a healthy amount of content. Uh, what's, what's your opinion on that, Karma? It's sure a paradigm shift and it will depend on how all of us adapt ourselves to this pretty new AI reality. What I mean is that ChatGPT3 is another tool for, for the content providers and may lead to an increase the quality standards. So it won't depend on the content that I, I it used to be, but in which quality we ask to the providers now. I think also uh, one thing when it comes to when it comes to uh, like uh, disclaiming the content. Uh, when it comes from chat GPT, like this is where we have to rethink about and the uh, like assessment approach. So do we really like just assess them on the end product or do we have to understand the, the journey that they went to? So for us, for example, the conversation that they did, the questions that they asked, what did they explore to assess them based on that? Or just, is it just for the essay that they wrote or the question that they answered? So I think this is good because I personally sensed that when I was studying uh, and uh, I was sometimes frustrated when I submit something and I put a lot of work into that and then I wouldn't get like a, a good grade. So I believe the current assessment that we have uh, should change and ChatGPT uh, came out there and showed that you have to change it. Uh, otherwise, you'll be incorrectly assessing the learner. Yeah, actually, yeah. That is the discussion, sorry, then. The discussions about using AI in education have already started and we are testing quality in different fields such as primary schools, university and big corporations and not everything works for everybody. We don't know yet what range of age should be appropriate, which are the best practices, when to use it, what kind of abilities the student will have to achieve before they can use it. So that, that's going to be a big discussion. Yeah, I, I think just back to language learning assessment, you've got really, at the moment, you've got this very well-known unhelpful situation where you can pass an exam. I got an A in my French GCSE. I'm terrible at French. I can't hold a conversation in it. And yet ChatGPT can assess, the Membok can assess whether I, I'm talking French well, much more in a much more nuanced way. And I think in the past, we had to rely on exams and sort of look for things like grammatical accuracy, which actually aren't very good proxies for can I make my message understood? These models are very, very much better at assessing that in a really reliable and, and scalable way, which is a really cool new thing, which I think you know, the education world kind of has to respond to. And I, I, actually one other, I think there was a question just about this, Pablo, from LearnCube saying, um, do you think it'll yeah. take as long purely for generating content, for language content for teachers. Um, so hi, LearnCube, nice to see you guys. Um, I, I think that your, your tutors in LearnCube should be using GPT-3, chat GPT, to generate um, content right now. I mean, I think they can just do it straight off the bat. But if you're a tutor creating content for people to enjoy, you should be doing it straight in a, in a lesson right now. And I think playing with chat GPT in language lessons, if you've got a tutor there, it can be a very 
fun and enjoyable and low stress activity. So I think you should, do should the they disclaim it, Ben? Sorry? Should they disclaim it uh, as, as they put in kind of the lesson plans or whatever? So they disclaim that the content was generated by. Uh, oh, actually, I, I'm, I'm more thinking as, as, a, as, a, as an activity to do inside a lesson. I think you do it together. Oh, I see. <laughs> you try inputting to it, see what it brings back. I, I think that, that that creative interaction with the language is, is precisely what makes it. Um, Actually, really some schools, they are already doing it and analyzing the text. And all of us do a uh, summarize and let's see which one it's from ChatGPT. So, yeah. so they are doing it straight yeah. away now. Yeah, Even also... from assessment perspective. Uh, sorry, Basil, please. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's also like tools that are emerging right now, like uh, Zero GPT, for example, that is able to analyze if this text is creating uh, using Chat GPT. So this can also help. But also to touch upon what you said, like to discredit the content, I think it's also like I should get credit for writing the prompt, and then Chat GPT should get credit for giving the content. So it's a collaborative work between me as the prompt that I gave to ChatGPT and the content that I got out there. It's not just ChatGPT having all the content giving it to me. So I did play a role uh, in that. Right. Yeah. Actually, that's a really, I see LearnCube have just replied saying I get different responses on whether you can rely on it. To be clear, you can't just rely on it as a black box that it's a perfect thing that you ask it questions and it always produces great content. Definitely not. But and so when, when I see some people posting on Twitter where they've said, God, chat GPD can't even do this. And they've asked it a question and it's given a wrong answer. They've misunderstood what, what is happening, that they're, or, or what the tool is there for. It's not that every time it will produce something back that's completely reliable. You've got to try and play the instrument. It's like me picking up my guitar and going, look, it's broken. It doesn't make a song. It's like, yeah, you've got to play it right. So yes, my guitar won't reliably make music. And yes, ChatGPT won't 100% reliably give you great content, but you can definitely use it to great, make great content. Actually, definitely, I think the, go sorry, Carla. Go. No, go for it. No, no, I continue interrupting. I'm, I'm, I'm a terrible <laughs> host, apparently, please. No, that's actually what we try to do, controlling over the contents. So instead of providing a random answer that sometimes ChatGPT can give you, we Koali gives you the correct answer based on your own contents. So instead of going through the whole internet, it goes just straight away to your contents. So then, then the question or the answer might be the one that you were looking for. Perfect. I think before we get uh, in a second uh, with some of the uh, kind of uh, Q&A from the rest, I, there was two more things I wanted to uh, get your, your views on. And I think it's aligned with some of what people are, are asking on the chat already. I think we could use probably another full hour answering all those questions. Um, you know, I, I think I'll make a, a brief parenthesis on the assessment side. I think, Basil, you, you mentioned about kind of zero GPT and... Uh, you know, even OpenAI came out with, uh, with an API, uh, AI text analyzer, but none of these are at the moment extremely reliable, even at, you know, classifying uh, the, the likelihood of a content being AI generated or not. Um, so on the assessment side, uh, we'll actually be posting, uh, it, it's, it's a core part of uh, what we spend a lot of time at EDT, um, some kind of uh, guidelines and best practices shortly. Uh, but the bottom line is that there is hardly going to be just one evidence that you can have if you want to find out who is using, uh, you know, generative AI to provide an answer. You're going to need to uh, to figure out more indicators. That's not just the the, the output, right? Uh, how it was, how quickly it was created, uh, a number of other things, uh, and as well, uh, you know, from uh, from an assessment perspective, Ben, I couldn't agree more with your comment before. It's like we need to figure out a new way of assessing skills and not, you know, uh, just deploying standardized testing for all, right? Uh, that the way we have done over the last hundred years. So it's around validating Kanban speak French or Mandarin, which I think we can, or at least a little bit, uh, but uh, but not not whether, you know, he can memorize a set of questions and provide them in a specific essay or, or, or uh, assessment. Um, to me, I think looking at the daily news on ChatGPT and moving on to the one of the last questions, 
Um, you know, Salesforce just announced uh, a GPT uh, version, uh, Slack as well, which is part of Salesforce. Uh, Notion, a very well-known kind of note-taking app, also has uh, GPT uh, embedded. So maybe this uh, Basel more connected to you since you kind of play with a few of these kind of social networks. Um, how do you plan to be ahead of competition, right? The, the, the times for innovation to implement, uh, we're seeing that are getting shorter. Uh, so how do you plan to stay different uh, with your products uh, in the next you know, 12, 24 months? So Pablo, actually, this is a very good question. And we get like a, a question, like why would we, why wouldn't we use like ChatGPT? Why would you use eFlow, for example? So the difference here is the data that you provide, the constraints that you put, fine tuning. There's a lot of things that go into the model to optimize it for your um, like approach. So for example, ChatGPT is created as a general AI model that can answer different questions, but it might give you like average uh, answers because it's trained on a very large uh, amount of data and it's not specialized into like the education field. So what we have different is we are making it more specialized. So we're building on top of it to make sure that it's more specialized into the education and even having it specialized in, in different fields. So when you're learning, you're getting the best uh, content out there, like close to the best uh, content out there. And we're making sure that it's factual responses. Uh, like there's a lot of things that go into that. Uh, also, actually, we have an intermediate model that plays a role to make sure that um, this is also what we need. So it's not just integrating with the API, which is very easy for any developer. It's customizing it for your own use case. So Ben has a separate use case that maybe if uh, I try to learn like eFlow on Ben's uh, bot, won't be able to get the results that I need. And he, if he uses our bot for language learning, wouldn't give the results that he has because his is specialized for language learning. Ours is specialized for uh, education and conversations. So this is mostly the like, difference. So basically kind of uh, deep specialization uh, in, in your context, in your use case. Uh, okay. Uh, ben, Carla, uh, what about you? How do you plan to stay ahead of competitors claiming to do something similar? Carla, <laughs> you go first. Actually, <laughs> Six months ago, we weren't able to do what we are doing now. <laughs> so I, I, we just know what we don't know anything. <laughs> so what we do now know is that everything is moving really fast and the use of AI in EdTech has a huge potential. So we have to be attentive to all the new futures and have a clean product so we can integrate it. But we don't really know how it's going to be. Right. So, so I think for us, the uh, you know, we we were first to market with a kind of AI language tutor, part, language partner um, product. But I got to believe the Duolingo are going to come out with something very soon. Quizlet have already put out something kind of along the same lines, and this is all building on ChatGPT, which is which is a paid product, but is the is the kind of leader at the moment. But you've got a whole load of open source versions that are catching up really quickly. You've got a whole load of other models that are going, that are breaking onto the next frontier. You've got Google, have got four internal models that they're waiting to release. So we've got a, I believe that the, the basic fundamental part of these LLMs is becoming commoditized very, very quickly. What won't, what isn't becoming commoditized is the user experience side of it. How you, how you build something that actually works for people. So this is part of what Basil is saying about specialized to particular use cases. And I think that happens in, in two ways. One is the fine tuning to particular sets of information. Um, I think that that's gonna become really, really important that knowing a particular domain really, really well and being able to respond to that. And then the other is how it plugs into a richer ecosystem. So at Memrise, my first slide there, learn, immerse, communicate. Now, those are three parts of the memorized product. Learn is where you learn words and phrases. Immerse is where we filter videos from YouTube, from TikTok, from everywhere, so that you can watch videos that just use the words and phrases that you know, and maybe 10% you know, more. And then communicate is this piece where you can communicate with a bot. 
But the key is that if you're communicating with the bot, when you're having the conversation, you don't know what to say, you're getting a hint, you can add those words to your words to learn. Then once you've learned them, you can see them being used in a film. It's that integration that makes it super powerful and means that what I'm not worried by Duolingo being, pulling out something similar because their entire product is structured around a course rather than structured around each individual learners. It's a syllabus centric learning rather than a user centric learning. And I think that we will see with these, in the old days, you kind of had to be syllabus centric because you needed to think everything through logically and organize it all up front. But what these LLMs have done for us is mean that we can be much more intelligent in the moment and be much more adaptive. And I think we'll see a lot more moving towards these um, user centric learning models rather than syllabus centric learning models. And I think that's where we'll get real, within education, where we'll get real um, moats around the business because that's, that's something that's very hard for legacy players to adjust to. Brilliant, thanks Thanks for those uh, three answers. I think the last two questions, and I'm trying to kind of get them together from feedback from, uh, from, uh, from the chat. Uh, one is more kind of personal question on my end. Uh, the other one, I think, coming from the chat. How about, do you have early proof of learning efficacy? Because, you know, there is a, a, in certain groups, especially on, on the policy making side, often it's like, you know, we thought that back on the day, just putting laptops in the classroom was going to make the classrooms more effective. And, uh, you know, with like the right type of experience and content is just a piece of hardware and provide certain access. Um, is there a risk that uh, kind of this AI is going to, you know, be a flood of uh, new products and new interactions, but actually have little output into kind of uh, learning outcomes? That's one uh, question, and I'm, I'm making this difficult by combining two questions. What do you, th do you think um, generative AI is working against or in favor of the digital divide that already exists in between, you know, uh, well-resourced countries or, or even schools or districts or, or families and, and, you know, uh, less... Uh, you know, resource uh, environments, the global south and, and other players. So basically learning outcomes and digital divide. Uh, floor is yours. So, so Pablo, when it comes to uh, AI, it should be more used to solve a problem. So now we see a lot of uh, like people trying to integrate ChatGPT because it's cool into their learning platform. But you have to think about it first. What's the approach that I want? So for us, the learning approach that we believe is in is more natural and conversational and this is why we're using ai and chat gpt to be able to do that if you just have a, a regular platform you just want to add chat gpt to make it smarter that might be more as a gimmick and wouldn't like really help in the learning uh, effic efficacy and approach uh, so I, I would say that we have to look first at what's the core of the learning approach that we have how can AI help with that and focus on that instead of just adding something that is like cool? Uh, so this is when it comes to uh, integrating. When it comes to digital divide, uh, I'm, I'm so interested to talk about this because actually how we started is we started when uh, COVID was there and part of our, or most of our learners when we started was from NGOs that are dealing with underserved communities uh, and refugees. And the only access that they had was WhatsApp. Uh, so we were able to introduce this learning to them and have them learn while, while uh, they have very low uh, resources. Um, so this is also something that helps to decrease the gap when it comes to the digital divide, uh, getting them to get like uh, very good content, uh, although they don't have the resources for that. Uh, or a better experience uh, without the need to have a tutor or, or a person just in front of them. Exactly. Uh, we are on top of the on top of the hour, and I don't want to prevent Carla and Ben from answering. So I'm just going to ask you to be extra extra short if you uh, if, if you can on your on your answers. Carla, do you want to go first? <laughs> no, I, I, I was just saying that, like for us, it's an approach that every student can have its own adaptation, like nothing to, related to their learning process. So it's not about 
if you have the resources or not, but is either you have the resources or not, is it adapted to yourself or you are in a classroom and you are not understanding anything at all, then let's adapt your the, the tool so it can be explained to you and to me and to everybody at its own pace. Yeah, yeah and you go, Ben. Yeah, so I think in terms of um, the efficacy, like no scientific studies have been set out on this yet because it's so new. Um, but the way we think about it at Memrise is that the proven piece, which is proven by decades and decades of um, research into second language acquisition, is that you need to practice speaking um, in a safe environment in order to get good at speaking in another language. That, that's really incontrovertible, um, the evidence for that. So the question then becomes, is talking with a bot a way of practicing talking? Well, on one level, self-evidently, yes, it is, because you're having a conversation. And in fact, you don't, you aren't terribly aware that it isn't a human because it's talking in such a human-like way. So in a way, this is just doing exactly what the research already shows um, is effective. To the, uh, one more thing, I see Halima in the chat talking about the assessment, uh, the rigorous assessment of whether, sorry, rigorous studies into whether chat GPT can be good at assessment. I 100% agree. Those haven't happened yet. I think they need to happen. My intuition is that chat GPT and other LLMs will be very good at um, assessment. Before that's rolled out and replaces the TOEFL exam, clearly there needs to be a lot of studies. But Another I think work, yeah. I, I got to believe that if you're running the TOEFL exam, you're pretty scared right now. And then on the other side, uh, the digital divide. Actually, as I said at the top of this, I think we actually flatten out the digital divide a lot because people currently don't have access to learning English because um, because of the cost divide in getting access to English native speakers. And this is a way to go against that. There is still that digital divide there as well, um, which we don't address. But I think that the addressing of that huge cost inequality that puts this kind of glass ceiling in between um, much of the world, much of the developing world and learning English, I think that this technology just breaks through that. Brilliant. So I'm I'm staying with, uh, and, and apologies, we're going uh, three minutes over the time, we're, I promise we're wrapping up in, in 60 seconds. I'm taking quite a few kind of highlights from what you guys described in terms of, you know, some of the, the importance of uh, the interoperability in between these tools uh, and systems uh, about the shortening time uh, to bring these solutions to market. So if someone out there is thinking on, I'm going to release my generative AI uh, in education solution for Q4 or Q1 next year, probably they are way late. So probably you need to accelerate. Um, you know, definitely around efficacy will be interesting to see not only on the assessment side and a number of other things. And uh, Carla was referring to the extreme adaptability, uh, basically having personalized interventions for every single learner of anything, being a language, being the lesson, uh, being TOEFL, whatever that might be, right? Um, so uh, brilliant. I cannot thank you enough. I wanted to, if anyone that has been following these or seen the recording has been inspired by these three phenomenal individuals and great initiatives, please feel free to reach out to them. I uh, wanted to highlight briefly a little bit of the work that we do in terms of technology and product and some of the partners that we operate with. Uh, so that you are trying to save costs on your kind of cloud deal or you know, get your product into a new market, obviously educational product into a new market, but thinking about assessment technology or implementing your next kind of uh, uh, AI initiative, not necessarily only generative AI, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. And uh, once again, thank you all. Uh, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Basil. It's been uh, a phenomenal uh, you know, experience uh, being this hour and a little bit with the three of you. Um, I wonder if we should already make a date for next year and see how this thing has changed tremendously over the next course of 12, uh, of 12 months. It, it, it might be fun. Uh, so maybe I'll challenge you to that early next year and, and we get on the phone again. Uh, thanks again. And thanks everyone for joining. Uh, see you all very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.